Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Matthews. I'm executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at Concordia University. Very pleased today to, um, to welcome you for the start of a series called Decoding Hate Speech, uh, a series uh, of, of high-level discussions with experts to understand um, how to counter um, uh, hate speech and incitement to violence. Um, and I said these, these series uh, aims to increase the understanding of and raise awareness about online hate speech within the atrocity prevention community and beyond in the lead up to GAMAC 4, a global meeting taking place in November 2021, which will address hate speech, incitement, and discrimination. We're very, very lucky today to have a series of great distinguished guests and experts. Um, for uh, those following us online on YouTube or Facebook, when it's time for question and answer period, if you could please mention what region or country you're, you're watching this from and title to your organization or an association if you do have one. Um, and now uh, we're very lucky to first have our moderator, uh, uh, who is Mo Bleeker, who is a special envoy for dealing with the past and atrocity prevention at the Swiss Federal Department of Federal Affairs. Um, we also have our panelists today. We have Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, who's founder of the Child Soldiers Initiative, and he's MIGS's Distinguished Senior Fellow. We have Katarzyna Gardelkatze, officer in charge at the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And we also have from the United Nations, we have Castro Wazemba, who's the Chief of Office of the United Nations Office for Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect. Um, so now I would like to pass the floor to Mo Bleeker and to have her um, moderate this very important discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Mo Blaker, and I'm the chair of the global prevention platform GAMAC. I first wish to thank very warmly the whole team of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies for this wonderful cooperation. And uh, for your information, each of us will facilitate one of the four coming sessions that we are realizing together. So thank you very much. I also have the pleasure to announce you that more than 200 around 230 people are registered, which is quite a, a success already. But it also tells us how much hate speech is really a preoccupation for all of us. So there are people from all continents and countries such as Colombia, Canada, Philippines, Denmark, Iran, Israel, the US, Switzerland, Sudan, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, and so many other countries. Let's also celebrate something important, at least in the heart of, of GAMAC, that we have participants that are our governments, CSOs and multilateral organization representatives, among them judges, archivists, members of truth commissions, of security institutions, educators, ambassadors, leaders of civil society organizations, and of multilateral organization. I think that's very important and it shows us that we are a community very diverse. Kyle already presented the fact that this is a series of four webinars we are aiming to increase the understanding of and raise awareness about hate speech and the vectors of hate speech within the atrocity prevention community. This We consider this also as preparatory step towards our global conference that will take place next year, GAMAC4, in November in Den Haag. So this is a process with uh, four meetings and um, today we will concentrate on understanding, unpacking, decoding uh, hate speech. What is it exactly? How does it work? And how is it linked to atrocity prevention? I want to uh, underline the fact that GAMAC and also MIX, we are both uh, giving a lot of importance not only to understanding, but also to acting. So our founding document from GAMAC, for example, states that no society is immune. So we are convinced that we are all together in this and that only all together we can make a change. Um, hate speech is on the rise in the world. And in May 2020, Secretary General Guterres called the international community to end hate speech globally in light of what he called the tsunami of hate and xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering unleashed by the global pandemic. Violence attributed to hate speech 
has also increased in recent years with documented cases in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka, in the US, and more recently in Europa, hate speech is escalating, for example, through incitements against the Roma community or also against migrants. This is a very serious threat, not only to our democracies, but also against global human rights standards that we have been building since several decades. Social media companies, we also have to take responsibility in this regard, and we are keen to understand today how they shall do this and how we can push that to happen. As we have learned from past atrocities during the Second World War, Rwanda, in the Balkans, in Cambodia, Myanmar, and in so many places throughout the human history, hate speech can indeed be a precursor to mass atrocities. It is therefore crucial to understand well what we are talking about in order to be able to address this phenomenon early and efficiently enough, even much before we even enter into a spiral of violence. I'm very grateful to our panelists, very distinguished, for helping us to decode these complex issues. And after the initial presentation, we will pursue the, converse, the conversation with our online participants. You know that you can send uh, questions. Some questions have already been sent, by the way. Um, and um, I don't know if General Dallaire is this, but in, with this doubt, I will maybe turn directly to Castro Vazemba of the United Nations Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect. I'm very pleased to meet you again, Castro, and very thankful that you are here. I would like to ask you several questions. On 18 of June 2019, Secretary General Antonio Guterres launched the United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech. Can you tell us why did the UN decide to design this new plan of action at this very moment and what triggered this decision? Um, second, there is no international legal definition of hate speech and the characterization of what is hateful is controversial and disputed as, as you know very well. How, how do you suggest to address this issue? And finally, what does the UN strategy and plan of action suggest to addressing and combating hate speech? And what do you recommend to member states and civil society in terms of implementation of this plan and prevention of hate speech? So that will be your turn, Castro. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, and I take this opportunity to thank uh, the Montreal Institute for organizing this very important seminar on itself. Um, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants here. Uh, I will just uh, as, uh, delve into the subject matter as, as, as Ambassador Moblika has just highlighted. Uh, I think, thank you for bringing out the most important uh, salient questions related to hate speech on itself. Um, you know, uh, as you have said in your introductory remarks, uh, Ambassador Mo Blinker, uh, hate speech has become a very um, concerning issue globally uh, across the whole world and all regions. It's not any specific to any particular region, but you know, globally we are seeing um, a very you know, high proliferation uh, of you know, uh, hate speech targeting the most vulnerable uh, people in the society. Uh, particularly, we, we have seen a hate speech that includes a long ethnic and religious minority targeting religious uh, and ethnic minorities. We have seen hate speech that targets uh, refugees and migrants, uh, scapegoating them. And amid this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have also seen very alarming side in hate speech, xenophobia, and scapegoating a number of, 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 of groups and individuals on each side. Uh, these trends are very worrying. And as you have directly said, uh, hate speech is an indicator of more serious uh, issues that underline our societies and sometimes can lead to violence, but even in extreme cases, 
hate speech can be a precursor to the risk of atrocity crimes. Uh, we have seen, uh, as, as you have said, uh, Moblika, in the past, uh, whether we start with the Holocaust or we go to Rwanda or what happens in Benisa, the violence in Central African Republic, Iraq, um, Myanmar, you know, and, and, and South Sudan and many other places, uh, that the whole violence is always preceded by demonizing the other group um, and, and, and sowing the seeds of division and mistrust among societies before even the violence itself is executed. Uh, therefore, you know, it, it's very important that we pay attention to this issue of hate speech. It's not just uh, an issue that we can uh, gloss over it and say, you know, it, 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 it's, it's enshrined within uh, the freedom of, of, of opinion and expression. Uh, we respect that uh, within the international law, but also we have to be cognizant of the risks that are associated with it. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, we respond to it. Um, these are some of the main reasons that informed the Secretary General uh, to ask the Special Advice on the Prevention of Genocide to coordinate the UN system and come up with the strategy and plan of action on head speech. It was informed of this very uh, concerning trend globally, both in the global north and in the South. Uh, it's threatening our democratic institutions and the human rights institutions and all uh, the, the fundamental rights that we, uh, we have achieved. Uh, why is it now? You know, uh, as you could see globally, I, I think there's also a worrying trend of reneging on multilateral and emphasizing, you know, kind of unilateral actions and, and a lot of nationalistic rhetoric globally, um, uh, we can see these trends. We have seen peripheral nationalistic part, political parties actually gaining power uh, on the rhetoric of, of, of nationalism and demonizing uh, certain groups on itself. Uh, with these trends of, on multilateralism, of course, the UN and the Secretary General was very much concerned and, and, and you know, uh, it's a bit worrying to see how hate speech has been used uh, to, 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 to drive towards this, uh, this trend on itself. Uh, so uh, I would just quickly highlight like what the hate speech is, 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 is uh, strategy and plan of action as it. As you have indicated in your introductory remarks, there's no legal definition uh, of, of hate speech. Um, and, and in fact, we, as much as we have developed this UN strategy and plan of action on, on hate speech, we keep on emphasizing that it is grounded in international law, uh, particularly uh, all the laws related, related to the freedoms of opinion and, and, and expression uh, uh, that should not be undermined in any way in terms of countering and addressing uh, hate speech. Uh, we have always emphasized that we cannot prevent hate speech, actually, but we can count it, we can uh, address it, we can come up with alternative narratives uh, to this because those who are propagating hate speech are ha actually using the freedoms that uh, are enshrined within international law uh, of expression and opinion to disseminate these messages of division. So the, the UN strategy and plan of action, the first thing it does is attempts to provide guidance as the parameters of what constitutes hate speech and what kind of hate speech should we be concerned about. Um, and, and I encourage all the, the participants to look at um, uh, this UN strategy to understand the parameters that we're talking about in the definition of hate speech on itself and what constitutes to be hateful in, in itself. Uh, of course, we are, uh, the fundamental uh, issue here is that we are concerned with hate speech that if it's not addressed, could actually uh, get to the level of incitement to violence. Uh, of course, we know that incitement in itself is clearly defined and prohibited within international law, whereas head speech is not. And therefore, we are concerned with head speech that is almost to the threshold 
uh, of, of where we can think that it could constitute elements of incitement to violence. And, and of course, the, on the extreme is incitement to atrocity crimes. So when you look at the UN strategy and the plan of action, the main attempt is to rally the international community to have a common understanding of what hate speech is. And then the second level uh, within the strategy is how do we respond to this very growing and very dangerous phenomenon in uh, the the strategy uh, sets out 13 commitments for action and is grounded in several core principles. The most critical is the importance of balancing the need to combat hate speech with the protection of the freedom of opinion and expression. Uh, in order to do this, it's important to have clear understanding of what constitutes hate speech and what measures, uh, legal and unlegal, exist to address it. So when you look at the 13 uh, commitments, uh, they're guided by the legal uh, uh, arrangement that is, that is in place. It's important to note uh, in this context that hate speech, which reaches the threshold of, of, of incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence, or incitement to genocide as defined in international law, is prohibited. Uh, of course, this is not to say that we should not look at other forms of hate speech, which at the moment do not reach that threshold in itself. The UN strategy and plan of action uh, attempts to address several levels of hate speech, but in particular addressing hate speech before it reaches the level of incitement. Uh, this includes addressing the root causes of discrimination, uh, we believe uh, that the most effective means of addressing hate speech is by understanding the root causes, the drivers, what makes the society resort to, 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 to hateful messages on each other of discrimination. Uh, it's something that the UN, we cannot do on our own, and therefore we need a bigger coalition to address hate speech. As you said, is there room for the civil society and other actors? We, absolutely. We need uh, research institutions. We need uh, member states. We need the civil society. We need the tech companies uh, that, uh, whose platforms are being used uh, to disseminate at a very rapid level uh, in addressing this, uh, this, this concern uh, on itself. Uh, therefore, the, the strategy, uh, the UN strategy recognizes this, but it's not going to do this on its own. Um, but we have to work very closely with these very important actors uh, for us to be able uh, to uh, address hate speech on itself. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Castro. Uh, it's, I think that's very important. You gave us a, a real good understanding of the different dilemmas, the tensions between freedom of speech and uh, hate speech. And basically you tell us also that, uh, first of all, the United Nations needs the support of member states, a civil society organization. We will see with Qatar Zina, uh, a series of examples of action in, in this regard. Uh, we didn't have time now to touch upon social media, but we will do it in, in the conversation. I think what you just said also about uh, the importance to address root causes, can be and can introduce very nicely uh, General Dallaire. We'll come back to you after uh, uh, Castro. Thank you very much. And General Dallaire, I'm, I'm happy that, that you made it uh, in spite of the technical uh, difficulties. So thank you so much to be with us. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's important. Your voice is important. And uh, it's, it's interesting that you speak just after, after Castro because you have been uh, witnessing um, this kind of uh, situation where hate speech uh, really led to um, to genocide. And I think it would be important to listen to you. We are all making somehow introductions during seven minutes to let after the participants also come in. So how in your experience did hate speech begin very concretely? Uh, in Rwanda, and how did it escalate to genocide? Sometimes it's difficult for people to understand that hate speech actually can escalate to the commission of atrocities. And at this time, what do you think now, 
decades have passed, but what what would have been done to prevent hate speech from spreading? And who who should could have acted to stop this deadly dynamic at this time? And um, several decades later, today, um, given that you are very involved in all these prevention activities, do you see changes about how hate speech develops in terms of content, in terms of manner in which it develops? And again, can you give us very concrete examples and maybe suggest us some recommendations to prevent this? And we'll come back also with you after with the questions of participants. Thank you very much and, and welcome with us, General Daler. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mullet. I'm glad you've given me seven hours and not seven minutes to respond to, to this uh, uh, series of questions. I'm going to go uh, to a far more uh, nearly aggressive dynamic of, of uh, the situation um, in as much as um, I am still looking for those who consider this truly a revolutionary period uh, of communications in the world where humanity is going to be able to Skype soon everyone in humanity. There's no more borders. We are now global. We're now a planet. We're now actually the whole of humanity. And so uh, I will uh, argue that uh, we're still trying uh, with some very arcane classic methods of meeting a brand new weapon system that's been deployed out there and that is proving itself to be exceptionally effective in the destruction of communities, of families, of, of uh, countries even, and sustaining conflict. So let me rapidly, because I want to keep my time uh, with you uh, under control, my last command was certainly in 1994 with, with Rwanda. And, and the tools of communications of that time, only 25 years ago, were pretty crude. I mean, we had the Radio Milkalen, and the people were listening as best they could to it. And some even considered it the voice of God, even. Uh, and so that instrument of communication uh, was the unifying factor to influence the whole of the population. Uh, and so what it really brought forward uh, was is that there are means in the hands of those who are intelligent, yes, but ruthless, uh, to be able to manipulate into, of course, uh, very, very effective weapons of influencing the population and ultimately pushing them, even as Radio Mikalin did, uh, to mass atrocities and genocide. And so we're in an era that is revolutionary because there's been in these imploding nations and failing states and the conflicts that have continued to flow around, we're seeing in so many of them a whole new set of weapons, weapons like rape being used as a very deliberate weapon, not by some rogue soldiers, deliberate to destroy through horror the social construct through fear. We've seen the use of children, children who can be influenced so significantly by the technologies, by the communications, by the ability, in fact, to talk to each other, to coalesce in real time, the children being used as the primary weapon system uh, in some of the conflicts and the mass atrocities, just like we saw in Rwanda, in fact. And this uh, has, in fact, uh, brought forward, in my opinion, the weaponization, after 25 years later looking at this, of weaponization of the social media construct. And as such, we're in a revolutionary technological time frame because the impact of what is in the hands of all the population, nearly all the population in one way or another, uh, has yet no limits, has let no, no optic of its full potential. And it is a very immature program. It's a very immature instrument that in fact uh, is open to all kinds of opportunities for those positive but certainly those who are negative. When I was involved with the reform of the officer corps looking in the year 2020 and this is 20 years ago uh, and trying to see what would be influencing us at the time, futurists were telling us that you know we're, we're in a time frame where uh, even our method of deductive reasoning of how we we reason to take decisions, 
uh, is going to be too slow because of the technolo technological information flow and technological availability that, to handle that. So we need a whole new way of philosophical framework of how do we think and how do we assess and how do we gauge different parameters of our social construct and ultimately save people, but also save some of the fundamentals like human rights without necessarily abusing people's rights to expression and the like. We, 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 we were told we're going to be seeing the man-machine interface. We're going to see some human beings who are going to be literally affected deliberately by mechanical means, electronic mechanical means, to actually create a new entity, a new personality, a new way of thinking. And, and so how, how do you control the inputs of that? And how do you in, uh, uh, influence the inputs that we're all getting? Like Google, what happens if Google goes rogue? What's going to replace Google? And who's controlling that? And, and is there something controlling that? And ultimately, artificial intelligence is now growing at an exponential rate. So you've got this, this communications tool that's been turned into a weapon system to pass on all the material that uh, we Castro has just been talking about uh, previously. And I don't see a sense of urgency. I don't see a sense of realizing that we need a whole new generation of means to go after this and neutralize this weapon system and this threat uh, to uh, security, to the populations, and ultimately uh, to peace uh, around the world. It's rather interesting that when they had the nuclear weapon systems and it started, I became patron not that many years ago of the a movement called the Pugwash Movement that was founded in 1957, and it, and it had as, as aim to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons and to create arms control. And so uh, you had the world focused on a weapon system that could literally obliterate humanity. And humanity, with its poor communication at the time, realized that and certainly gave different levels of support to it. Uh, and it permitted uh, a certain control that at times we still have some very, very serious concerns about uh, with certain countries. However, we created something pan global. It wasn't just the nation states, it was pan global. So, what do we have now in a world where borders don't count? That we, in fact, are seeing the most prolific utilizers of these systems, the social media, are the youth. And they're the one less capable of looking at the risks of it because their brains are still being developed. They're under 18, many of them, even up to 25, our brain sort of has grown to its maturity. But the risk assessment of playing with something of this nature is still, for many of them, immature. And as such, the vulnerability is extraordinary. And with the demographics of the world, the youth who are the main users, the ones who are, in fact, leading the pack on trying to make this system dance, are the ones who are the most vulnerable to being influenced by it. So, so what are we doing about this generation without borders to be able to manage that impact uh, that they have? And so it is, for me, a fundamental premise that although we have the strategic uh, plan, the, the strategy and plan of action for hate speech that the Secretary General has admitted, and I've gone through it, and many of you have read it and so on, you know, this is, this is classical using nation states and goodwill and hopefully the engagement of citizens to try to bring to a certain level of maturity and control and discipline an instrument that is a weapon that is nurturing conflict, mass atrocities, and genocide. And the instruments that are improving that weapon, like artificial intelligence, are growing, and we're still fiddling with how do we debate this and how do we gain uh, acquiescence by nations. We got to look global. We need a global movement. We need a global fear, as we did with nuclear weapons, to stop this from the, the uh, means by which uh, those who are ill will are able to use it and use it very effectively. Remember, Radio Midkarin 
It was just a very simple radio, but it changed the youth of that nation, particularly one ethnic group, from being just part of a young youth movement of a political party into, through being a gang and being very belligerent into a militia that actually slaughtered nearly a million people. Hey, the stuff we got now is way beyond that. And yet the solutions that I'm hearing are lacking urgency and lacking any innovative approach that is even close to those who are continuing to improve that instrument and turn it more and more into an effective weapon and a threat to us all. Thank you. General Adalera, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we do organize this uh, series of webinars precisely because it's urgent to act. And I could endorse also uh, your statement about the proliferation of uh, weaponization of communication. Um, and in particular, I, I think that what you have described also in the sense of vulnerability among youth and children to um, attacking also the sense of social um, construct and the common good is absolutely at, at the heart of that. And we, we hope that with the participant, we can get to a kind of good understanding of that. Nevertheless, um, uh, I think that we have different tools at disposal. I do agree that we are in a process. We are always too late. Uh, we are much too late, uh, but we have to react uh, strongly. And as we are in the process of unpacking what is its speech exactly, and we have these three more sessions to inform each other and to get to this better understanding, and I think also to a shared uh, feeling of emergency, General. Uh, this is where we want to go, and, and therefore a shared feeling of action is needed now. Uh, I would like to turn to Katarzyna. Katarzyna is working uh, within the uh, OSCE, uh, in uh, the Office uh, for Human Rights and um, for, for Democratic Institutions and, and Human Rights. Katarina, you are, Katarina, you are every day uh, dealing with these issues. Uh, you are every day seeing what, what happens uh, as a consequence of hate speech. Also, as uh, General Daler was saying it, the deconstruction uh, on purpose of uh, social community, of common good, of peaceful coexistence. I would like you to share with us what are the different manifestations of hate speech that are taking place in your context now, so that we kind of feel also the dimension of what General Dallaire was saying before. It's urgent, it's happening now and it's deadly. So can you share some example with us and did you see a particular increase during the COVID-19 pandemic? And how did your office respond to it um, in cooperation with government and civil society? Did you see some failures also? Where, where is it that we are missing instrument? I also would like to draw your attention, General Dalle has been speaking about uh, youth and children. Are they the champions with whom we have to work? Or are there other champions with whom we have to ally to work to build this kind of global resistance and uh, global mobilization against these deadly weapons? And, um, and how do you see the civil society and governments should cooperate? I know that your, your office has produced many documents. You are constantly working in, in trainings. Can you share some insight uh, with the participants that are here around. Thank you, Katarzyna, you have the floor. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. It is difficult to be the last speaker because uh, everyone before you has already said everything that you were thinking about. Um, and also I will uh, go back to this. Uh, it's not easy for us in the context of the OEC to speak about hate speech and I will uh, explain why, but I want to share some reflections uh, in general uh, about hate speech and what it does. As uh, we probably all know, it was exactly one week ago when um, a 17 year old uh, with a rifle killed two people and wounded another one on the streets of Kenosha in the United States. 
Um, and what struck me was that it took Facebook 24 hours to take down a group uh, that was calling uh, for violence and calling to take up arms and defend the city from evil thugs. And it's not that Facebook didn't know uh, about the call and about the event and about the call to violence. Uh, on that very day, it received more than 450 uh, reports about incitement to violence, but it replied uh, that it did not violate the policy of Facebook. So they chose not to act until it was too late. Uh, and that was really striking, and that I think is in a sense a, a, a sign of times. Um, and we, as, as was said before, neither violence nor killings appear out of nowhere. Uh, at ODIR, we work a lot with hate crimes, and I will go back to this, and we say that hate crimes are message crimes because they are a manifestation of hatred and discrimination against a group or a community to which the victim belongs or is perceived to belong. It's like uh, Mr. Marian Turski said in his famous speech at the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Violence creeps up on us word by word, step by step, comes closer until what has been unthinkable before becomes a deadly reality. Uh, unfortunately, OSC participating states have given ODIR a very strong mandate to address hate crimes, but none to work on hate speech uh, that precedes the crimes. Um, and as was mentioned before, when um, when uh, we talked about the definition in the OSC context, we don't even talk about hate speech. We call we talk about intolerance discourse, and it is a real pity that this uh, issue is not discussed. If this is discussed, but it, there's no mandate to address it, because hate speech is now everywhere, uh, from online platforms uh, to public words coming from top political figures, and what was unthinkable be, unthi unthinkable before uh, has now become mainstream. Uh, when it comes to COVID-19, uh, we have analyzed the effects of the so-called states of emergency or whichever the, the delineation of those was introduced uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the, their effects on democracy and human rights. And what we have noted was a steep surge in hate uh, speech or the inter intolerant rhetoric offline and online um, and also associated with it disinformation and misinformation, often scapego scapegoating and stigmatizing individuals and groups across the region. And we saw that people in marginalized and vulnerable situations, as mentioned before, Castro said, ethnic, na national, religious minorities, migrants and refugees were particularly affected. What we have also seen is that state actors and others have framed the public debate during the pandemic around repeated appeal to emotions. And they have preyed on people's uncertainties, on anxieties, on fears and lack of information. They have peddled negative stereotypes and conspiracy theories that incited hatred and that often led to discrimination and violence. And what the general just said uh, is also in this context striking because what is in a formal definition of psychological warfare, which is any action which is practiced mainly by psychological methods with the aim of evoking a planned psychological reaction in other people, is exactly what this message have been doing. Uh, so there is certainly uh, a need to understand the sense of urgency and the sense that this is uh, a weapon. Um, we have seen also that before the pandemic, uh, um, there were rising concerns about the widespread use of social media platforms, digital technologies to dis disseminate hatred and serve as vehicles for propagating hate speech. And it really spreads like a virus. And I will not talk about artificial intelligence bots and other things, but I want to say uh, what it does. And uh, and it's interesting what it does, not only to like-minded, but also to unsuspecting people um, as it amplifies and for some normalizes the message of intolerance. Um, in political silence, we have this concept termed the Overton window or the window of political discourse. Um, uh, the concept effectively says that in the center of the window are mainstream ideas that are socially acceptable, 
the political lines and policies that are okay for people. At the outer edges, we have radical lines of debate that are starting to permeate small sections of society. And outside the window, there are things that are socially unspeakable. And what, that, what happens when hate speech is aired publicly is that it becomes normalized. So the Overton window, the range of ideas tolerated in public discourse shifts. So when white supremacists call for violence against people of color, then more moderate, subtle forms of racism appear somewhat reasonable in comparison. There was a recent study done in Poland that found that exposure to angry, hostile content against specific groups indirectly increases prejudices of people, exactly because it desensitizes them towards those groups. So when key political figures speak about banning Muslims from their countries, compare refugees to a plug, and announce the creation of LGBT free zones, the internet that is built to reward clickability over accuracy shifts, shifts the overton window quickly, and what is socially unspeakable becomes mainstream. Um, I would like to go for a second uh, to two, uh, two points. One is that the universal human rights to freedom of opinion and expression mentioned earlier, it should complement and reinforce other human rights to safeguard the core values of non-discrimination. But we see that human rights no longer advance together as a part of single, indivisible and interrelated framework. Uh, because as mentioned before, freedom of expression is far too often abused to stir up hatred and destroy other rights and freedoms protected in democratic societies. But there's also this old saying in the law, your liberty to swing your fist ends just where my nose begins. It basically conveys the principle that your right to exercise whatever liberty you think you're entitled to ends when it threatens my life and safety. So when Mark Zuckerberg calls a decision not to take the Kenosha group off Facebook an operational mistake, it is highly inadequate and your inner irresponsible, I would say, answer to anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories, and outright violence that really reek across the platform and lead to people being killed. And I think there are two things that we need to do to address this. Uh, as kind of primary uh, primary uh, priority. Um, it's not about more, more state control of social media, and it's not certainly about social media companies self-regulating. What we need to prioritize is building a system of shared responsibility where state institutions, businesses, international and civil society organizations, academia and others deal together with the misuse and abuse of social media. And secondly, and I think this is equally and critically important, we need a massive investment in educating people in emotional intelligence, critical and analytical thinking, and digital literacy, starting from early age and using all formal and informal channels. Because I think only with such an investment, we will be able to build resilience and counter insensitivity and complacency. And I will just end with, a quote uh, from Marian Turski and also building on what the general just said. Um, if people become complacent before we know it, some kind of Auschwitz will suddenly appear from nowhere and befall us and our descendants. And I will stop here for, for now um, and happy to, uh, uh, to look forward to the discussions and happy to answer questions. Katarzyna, thank you so much. Uh, as well as you, General Daler and Castro uh, Wazemba are telling us how this is a deadly weapon that we should really not underestimate. Our participants from all over the world, um, I, I suppose everyone is seeing the comments. It's, it's fascinating to see that we are so many people from the global planet. We have a similar question. I want to recall you because this session is quite uh, short, but I want to recall you that we will have three other sessions on uh, artificial technology, uh, social media, and, and we are still trying to unpack uh, what is it speech and, 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 how to, and how to address it. So uh, we had a very strong reaction from uh, General Daller to, you know, uh, in the UN, uh, and I want to add what you said, Katarzyna, um, as we are seeing world leaders 
who are um, using hate speech uh, in international meetings. And we see the, both the complexity and the perversity of uh, what is now being put in place uh, in, um, in a kind of total tsunami manner in the sense that we can't apparently uh, stop it. So we need a strong alliance, we need strong actions, we need a strong understanding and we need um, early early victories uh, to set it up. So I, I would like to have the three of us in a kind of very straightforward language and, and very concrete and very engaged to, to share with us um, about what can we do. It's urgent huh? and it is as destructive as nuclear weapons, while nuclear weapons, we can basically somehow see them, or they are physically there. Hate speech has this kind of in invisible, immaterial dimension that really contributes to destroy community and to lead us to generate such an inhumane uh, understanding of who is the other so far that it can justify killing other human beings as if they are animals. Uh, so I would like to hear the three of you, we have uh, 10 minutes, um, making uh, recommendations for steps ahead. If you feel that one or the other aspect has not been uh, addressed enough, go ahead. This is the session for decoding and unpacking hate speech so that we are all on the same line, we understand what we are talking about, and we continue the conversation after in, in the next session. So uh, the floor is yours. Be straightforward and communicate. You have seen also the comments of the participant. So what is there something missing in what we said, the three of us? Uh, what shall we do? First steps and midterm and long-term steps. And uh, Yes, the floor is yours. Uh, Cast General Daler and then uh, Castro and then uh, Catazina, if it's okay for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohd, and uh, and well done. Um, I'm I'm looking at the the Sec General's uh, strategy and plan, action for hate speech, which which is not an insignificant document to get, be able to get that out of the UN in itself is quite a quite a feat but when you look at it it says engaging in advocacy it says convening relevant actors engaging with new and traditional media uh, when they went after the nuclear non proliferation uh, and arms control arms limitations they didn't go and try to discuss this and work it out with uh, um, governments leaders, uh, uh, diplomats, and, and, and the like. Um, what they did uh, in Pugwash was convene 20 of the world leading nuclear physicists, including the Russians at the height of the Cold War, to them figure out what would be the best way to grasp this weapon system and to be able to uh, control it, to try, try to establish a certain discipline, trying to bring it under a level of control that the world then can adjust to meet. Well, you know, we should be hauling in those that these young people who use the media and all the technologists and so on, bring them to the forefront of coming up with this, the answers, bringing the, the guys who have made fortunes on them, make them pay for it because they've got more money than Carter's got liver pills, get them to pay to bring all the brain power of the world that's working in the technological and the advancement of these instruments, this instruments that is out of control, that is immature, and in this revolutionary times being abused, get them to get together and to pull this and to dictate how they see the future is going to be and how they want to move it and how nations better adjust. That's my five cents. 
Thank you, General Dale. In other words, I would say how to engineer responsibility uh, with the people who are the vectors of the hate speech. That's not enough, we know, but that's a way to do it. I think we are all complementary, and this is why it's important that we know of each other doing this and that, and um, that uh, everything can contribute to capitalizing and getting some strength in that. Castro, I'm, I'm interested about your reaction. I think you have published a very important document. We know how complicated it is to spend hours negotiating a, a resolution, documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what do we have in, in hands with your document and, and how can we mobilize the states and what, what, what is your reaction uh, towards the, I would say, the recommendations of General Dallaire? Thank you very much, uh, General Belair. Thank you, Ambassador Moblika. You know, participants, head speech is so scary. And there's a lot of agents in there. And part of it is because it's not clearly legally defined. And you cannot go anywhere and say, with a bullet, you know, magic bullet, this is head speech. It's a very gray area. We have seen governments cracking down on the media, putting people behind bars, shutting the internet in the name of dealing with hate speech. We have to be very careful, okay? Within the international law, the most dangerous speech is prohibited under the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and under the Genocide Convention. So the most dangerous speech in incitement is prohibited. Hate speech, is a great area where you see even leaders at the currently are using it for political mileage within the existing law itself. Therefore, criminalizing hate speech is not enough, okay? Because even the people who are in power are the ones that we are seeing spewing that uh, hate on itself. So what do we recommend on this? One is that we have to understand that we need more speech, not less speech. Therefore, we encourage all, as, as, as Katarina has said, it's a shared responsibility. You know, we have seen what fact checking can do, even with the most powerful people. If you put the facts out there, it's gonna have a counter narrative on that. So we encourage every actor to put out a counter narrative to head speech. Let's use uh, the, 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 the digital uh, uh, advantage that we have, that you have, it doesn't matter who you are. If you have done your research, you know what the facts are, put those facts out to deal with the counter narratives. The second thing, uh, Moblika, we don't have much time, is to think about the victims. Um, that we also have to take the victim approach and all the time try to identify yourself with the target group and give a counter narrative and support to that target group. Because in most cases, the head speech is targeting the most vulnerable. But as much as we deal with the tech companies and, and the governments and civil society to counter head speech, we should also invest very heavily uh, on, 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 on the victim. And finally, we have to be aware when we are doing monitoring and analyzing head speech that we have a common understanding because we have seen many governments putting extra, extraneous laws, criminalize head speech, and we have seen it's just a pretense to hold on to power on itself in the name of countering head speech. So we have really to be very careful that it's a gray area, but we must respond be within the international law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Um, uh, very good. Um, I think we, we follow with Katarina and then I will try to make a, a, a little synthesis of, of what you are saying. Katarina, um, can you can you take the floor, please? Um, I, I, I having agreed with everything that was said uh, before. I want to say, in I think in 80s and 90s, uh, we have seen uh, uh, in many many countries, especially the new democracies, a massive massive coordinated investment in what was then termed uh, civic education. Uh, especially for young people, um, uh, and that led to the creation of uh, of uh, a very vibrant civil society, a lot of new NGOs, a lot of new civil society groups, uh, and then it was considered mission accomplished, and the investment kind of died out. Um, and I think what we really need, and I uh, that's 
one of the things that we prioritize, but of course, uh, with resources that we have vis-a-vis -vis the scale of need, we can only uh, uh, do so much, is educating people on uh, and building resilience and building uh, uh, civic responsibility uh, uh, within societies. Um, and I know that it works because when we, for example, look at Finland that has been consistently um, ran ranking first, for example, in um, uh, society's ability to deal with the phenomenon of fake news, um, we know that this type of education works. So this is, I think, a very urgent, uh, urgent investment that needs to be made. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's one thing. And I, uh, I cannot agree more that uh, uh, that we really need to deconstruct uh, the the concept of hate speech, uh, but um, but I would I would really go back to this to this concept, my liberty, uh, and uh, where uh, where your pain begins, uh, because I think and these two are linked. Uh, uh, we 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 need education because education sensitizes people uh, towards the other human being. And that's exactly what we need to do. Otherwise, the whole movable middle uh, of uh, people who are not neither for nor against, but are easily manipulated, uh, will simply be taken away and taken towards uh, the, the negative narrative, the hateful narrative, uh, and we know where it ends. Katarzyna, Katarzyna uh, Castro and, and General Dallaire, uh, thank you so much. Um, I have two minutes to, to make a conclusion. What, what did I learn from what I heard? Uh, that this is a massive, holistic uh, threat to humanity. Uh, this is a, a deadly weapon. And uh, we need to organize a multiple answer by diversity of actors to address this uh, deadly industry of dehumanization. So um, what is important that, and I think this is part of the atrocity uh, prevention, at the heart of this is the constructive management of diversity. Huh? And this is precisely what uh, this weapon, uh, this weaponization of communication is trying to, to basically um, uh, cut and destroy. It's uh, the peaceful coexistence of diversity and the interdependence or the celebration of practical interdependence uh, of us in, in, uh, in, in the humanity. You have been saying this, um, I would say what I'm hearing is that there is a need of a massive global movement uh, that is strong enough and has a leadership strong enough to be able to call upon the ones that are launching uh, social media uh, technical uh, weapons, as you call it, General Daller, and and to ask them to take responsibility also to propose solution. And on the other hand, there is a need, an absolute need of the continuous effort of uh, multilateral institutions such as uh, the UN, but also the OSCE, among them ODIR, to help states not only to identify that, but to take the responsibility at their national level. Uh, you have said it, Carlos uh, Castro, it's possible to, um, to uh, work on legal frameworks. It's possible, it's not enough, but it's possible to address this situation, hate speech, where it happens directly. And therefore you need very strong national constituencies because all this is always very localized, very contextualized, and we need to be very near of this context so that you can awake and strengthen the leaders um, and from all kinds of um, a group, social groups, from the youth to the children, the educators, the judges, the journalists, etc., to fight uh, against it. Now, we have several challenges in front of us. Uh, one is the legal challenge, uh, and we need to find this, this balance uh, between freedom of speech and uh, hate speech and, and call to incitement. And that's, I think, I would say it in a positive way. This is a wonderful opportunity for our democracies. 
Uh, so I think this is also a pending task for a global alliance against uh, this hate speech, as well as generating and cultivating champions, uh, not only in the countries at national level, capable to stand up, uh, check the facts, and be able to give a consistent answer, as, as Castro and, and Katarzyna were, were saying, but also globally. So uh, I think this is uh, what I've heard from you. We still need to impact, uh, the, the, unpack um, many details about uh, hate speech. I uh, received also a message from uh, Guatemala saying, and what about uh, the use of law to, um, uh, you know, to, to label uh, human rights defenders as terrorists, for example. Well, there are many abuses that go hand in hand with nationalism, authoritarian regime, and uh, they have their past and their instrument to destroy what you said, General Dallaire, the social fabric. And this is what we want to fight for. I would like to thank you very much, as I understand that it's now, um, we have had an hour of conversation. I'm sorry uh, to each of us because we have been somehow very superficial because that's the time we had during an hour. But I think it was a promising discussion. We need to continue it. Uh, in November next year, GAMAG and MIX and, and uh, UNOSFG and ODIR and OSCE, we will be all together. And I hope that during now and next year, we'll have maybe general a rising movement there capable to make some a substantial statement and some substantial um, contributions and recommendation. The difference will be that we can do this together. We are all together in this and all together we got out of this. So thank you very much. And um, thank you to all the audience from all the countries and see you soon for the next session. Goodbye and good afternoon and good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.